Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Pump. In this episode, we talk about the benefits of loaded stretching for building muscle. The guys go into detail about what it is, how to use it, and how it can benefit you. Later, we talked about how low melatonin levels may contribute to leptin resistance and fat gain, as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, we answered four questions from our Mind Pump Media Instagram account. Questions such as, how can I target my chest when doing dips? Should I do refeed days when cutting? What are the best foods for bulking? And what is the best protein powder for someone who can't tolerate whey? Finally, if you've been listening to Mind Pump for a while, you're probably looking pretty sexy and your friends and family are probably wondering what you're doing. Well, you may not know how to answer their questions, but we do at Mind Pump Clips. Have them go over and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. All right, check this out. Stretching can actually build muscle. You just have to do it the right way. Loaded stretching has been shown to increase IGF-1 in muscles. That's insulin-like growth factor, very anabolic hormone. It also has been shown to upregulate the receptors that IGF-1 attaches to, it works with. And it also has an occlusion effect uh, similar to muscle occlusion training where it fatigues muscle fibers and causes the fast twitch muscle fibers to build even faster. So you can add this to your routine. doesn't cause much damage, improves your range of motion, and it accelerates results. Old knowledge? Old knowledge. This is, uh, but there's there's studies that are starting to support, you know, loaded stretching. But this is like a favorite among bodybuilders for a long time, right? The, yeah. Where they, they finish a workout with like a isolation exercise that puts a muscle in a stretch, focusing on the stretch. And then other bodybuilders have, have figured out that if you take an isolation exercise, put a muscle under stretch, hold it under stretch mm -hmm. for 30 to 45 seconds, you get these crazy pumps. And What's the most know? common ways that they do that with a, like a chest fly, for instance, and like in that stretch position? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so hold. like a chest fly would be one for the back or the lats. It'd be like hanging from a bar or a lat pull-down bar getting a lat stretch. Bicep, right, would be... Uh, like an incline bench with two dumbbells hanging down. Delts you could do on a flat bench where you're holding down down here. Um, quads, obviously, you could set in your heels. Hamstrings, that's an easy one. But basically, what you do is you get a pump, and at the end of the workout, you do this like extended, loaded stretch, and it's 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 like a you know it's like a few percent more stimulus for muscle growth, and it's easy to add. And then the the, the real benefit that I enjoy from it is it helps me work on improved range of motion because yeah. Um, that's the best time to do a static stretch at the end of the workout because you're not well, doing any more exercises. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've done something similar, but it's mainly just intrinsic. So it wasn't loaded stretches, but it was like those positions. But now you're really like digging into it and adding yeah. muscular tension um, to kind of reinforce those positions. If it's hard to get in those positions, especially, but in terms of muscle building, like I could see loaded, you know, stretches being an option. Now, mechanistically, what is happening? Is it facilitating recovery at a faster rate because you're relaxing the muscle? Like, cause it, obviously if you're lifting, right, you just got done with a massive pump, you're in a state of tonus and the, and you're like active still. If you do this like static stretch for more than 30 seconds, it tells the CNS to kind of relax. Does that speed up the the process of recovering because of that? Is it, I what are the real benefits that are happening? Yeah. I, I don't know if it speeds up recovery, but I do know that it's loaded. So it's not necessarily like a recovery type of stretch because like if I'm doing a weighted fly and I'm holding it here at the bottom and I'm letting it stretch my chest, there's still kind of an isometric thing that's going on, right? I can't completely, or my body's not going to completely let go. Um, otherwise I'd hurt myself. So it's, it's, you're still getting the isometric contraction. Mm -hmm. What you're also doing though, when, when a muscle is pumped and you're stretching it and loading it, you're, you're, uh, you're squeezing the muscle, the, the, the muscle of blood, all the waste products are kind of building up. It burns like crazy. If you've ever done this, it's very, very painful. It feels like it allows your uh, that fluid to kind of travel a little bit more to end range in terms of your muscle. Like I don't know if that's <laughs> well. What I notice is after the stretch, the when you let go of the it. dumbbells, yeah. the pump comes back like super, super intense. My favorite value of it is it helps with range of motion um, for the next workout because yeah. I get this deep stretch. I've already trained the muscle. I'm not worried about weakening the muscle because it's at the end of the workout. And then when I go back into my workout the next time, I tend to have a little bit of better range of motion it, and then you can train in, in better range It would of be motion. interesting to me to see it compare to somebody who like let's say a group of people that do the the stretching afterwards then another group does just traditional isometric type of yeah. holds afterwards and then another group let's say does 
two reps, two or? no, two more reps of a. Oh, of I see what you're saying. Set. So mm. let's say let's say we use the chest fly example. I would love to see a study that shows somebody who does just an isometric hold on the chest afterwards. A group that would do the the stretch like you're saying, and then another group that would just add two more reps or yeah. another set of flies and then which one potentially the, builds the most the muscle. The closest thing that we have to that is they did do a study on mm. isometric holds comparing uh, both ends and ranges of motion. So fully contracted versus fully stretched. And they found that the fully stretched isometric contraction uh, resulted in more muscle growth. Mm. So like, you know, holding a bicep squeeze here versus holding it here at a stretch, for example, the stretch position produced uh, a little bit more muscle growth than the-, the Okay, so we do have research to show that. Yeah, so it's like, it would be like comparing, um, I guess- it would But I mean, like, you could also still do it, you could do an isometric hold yeah. that's- Yeah, so that's that's the squeeze part, right? Right. Because it doesn't stretch. get as much emphasis otherwise, like in the exercise. It's like doing, um, uh, it's like comparing uh, concentric to eccentric. So what if yeah. you did though an, an isometric hold then like against a wall- Yes. Opened up. Yes. So and, that would be in the stretch position. Right. Yeah. That's where they see you get more muscle growth. And I, and I also think that it doesn't cause much damage. So it's something that's easy to add versus if you add a few more reps or an exercise- you may tip yourself over. It's a different stimulus. So there's that novelty mm -hmm. aspect. I notice bet more results uh, with certain muscle groups with this one. Delts are really hard. Like delts are hard to get into a stretch position. So that one's always tough for me. My lats, crazy pump. Quads, crazy mm -hmm. pump. Chest, mm -hmm. crazy pump. When I do, and it does, it's not. Um, it's not adding much more to your exercise. It's really easy to do. Uh, at the end of your workout, and it's a lot of fun. I know Ben Pakolsky was a big proponent, and he does it in between sets. He does intra-set yeah. yeah. intra stretching. So it? he doesn't even do it at the end. He does it after a set and then gets back into a yeah, set. Yeah, but again, the, the thing that I that just makes me wonder if there's – what we're seeing is we're obviously what's happening is you're stimulating the muscle again. Yeah. So would a isometric, just a traditional isometric hold and or another rep or two or another do set the same thing. do the same thing? Right. And it's like, are we really – overvaluing something that, okay, so the, the argument is, okay, there's some value there. I think the best argument is what you started to say as far as the novelty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you're- It's just you're, different. Right, yeah. If your go-to move is always just to add volume, add more reps, add more sets, and you, you eventually will peak out on that. So here's another technique that maybe potentially doesn't do as much damage to the body, and that's novel. It's a novel stimulus, so maybe you'll get the benefits there, but- Yeah, yeah. and I think it it points back to doing full range of motion, the, the importance of that, yes. right? Because it's- Maybe you aren't tapping its full potential because you're not fully in that. You're not challenging that stretched position uh, enough. That's where that's where I think the real value. Because let's say they were all, they were all equal. Let's say what you said, everything's equal. Yeah. The value would be then just increased range of motion in the stretch position for muscles that you're tight in, right? So like yeah. like I tend to get real tight in my quads, and if I don't stretch them deep, I mean I can't even sit on my heels. That's how tight they can get, um, and I don't really get into that position with any strength training. There's really no strength training exercise that stretches my quads. I mean, a sissy squat kind of, but um, this would do that, right? Because mm -hmm. this, at the end of my workout, I could sit on my heels, get a gnarly stretch, and then increase that, you know, kind of get that range of motion I don't necessarily tap into. Yeah. When I'm so doing I, had, I went on a kick where I was doing this quite a bit. And uh, of course, this is my experience, right? So there's no, I have nothing to, I can prove. This is what I, what I thought I recognized was, uh, and that's why I asked to facilitate recovery. I, I thought I didn't get as sore. Oh, interesting. That's what I felt like. I felt like when I did a I good, pay attention to when, I, when I did a good job of stretching really well at the end of these workouts like this with weighted stretches or hangs or something like that I do for my lats. Like so I do these things afterwards. Hmm. When I and I and I, I had a pretty good sense of the feel of a lift where I know like, oh, this is gonna get me. Right. Mm -hmm. That's actually actually what would promote me to do is like, oh, I started to notice that if I do a good deep stretch afterwards, yeah. I wouldn't be quite as sore uh, the next day or the day after. But again, I, I don't know if that's what's really happening with that or not, or that was just by coincidence that whenever I did that, we're just the the workouts there, weren't as taxing. There's this really interesting, okay, so uh, you want to take this with a grain of salt, right? But there was an animal study where they took birds and they put one wing in a weighted stretch position. Oh, I remember when you talked about For this. like a long time, like they'd leave it there for hours or days or whatever. And the muscle growth that the bird went through on the stretched wing was Rem like crazy, yeah, like ridiculous muscle growth, and they speculated that this may even contribute to, again, grain of salt here. So everybody just kind of relax, but uh, hyperplasia, 
where this may contribute more to muscle fiber for you, you know, muscle fiber splitting and becoming, you know, one muscle fiber becomes two muscle fibers, which that's the holy grail of muscle growth, right? Right. You can make muscle fibers grow or shrink, but if you but you, you can increase some, them, yeah. they don't go away. Yeah. So now you've got extra muscle fibers and building muscle becomes much easier. Do you easier. think that's one of the the key components of uh what makes somebody like a like a like a nat a good natural bodybuilder? Like they have those type of genetics that they actually have hyperplasia happens at a at a much faster or easier to rate than the totally. average person. I would one hundred percent. Got to be so. a factor to that. Yeah. And I think also if if it does happen in humans, which it's widely believed that it does because we observe it in animals, I think it, it, it the best example are just old lifters mm -hmm. who've been working out for decades. And then, you know, they've been working out for so long. It's like they've got this kind of permanent muscle that doesn't go away. Which, yeah. I mean, I think you have a friend like Ben Pekulski. You brought him up already. Like he's a good example of that. Of someone trying who like, to get small. And he's yeah. Still. <laughs> just still looks unbelievably muscular yeah. because he's, he's probably at now is the reason why we don't know that is because the only way you can test that is when they're dead. I think you have to do a bunch of muscle like, biopsies. Actually and, cut it out. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, Dr. Andy Galpin has done that. And yeah. They've shown how, you know, it happens. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you guys have experienced this. We've all been working out for decades ourselves. Mm -hmm. How much easier is it to stay your size now than it was oh, I've, in no, your I've, 20s? I've shared this before on the show that when I fall out of shape uh, today, I'm still in better shape than I was, you know, three years or five years of consistently lifting. Yeah. So, I mean, once you, I mean, that's, that's one of the cool things about, it's like investing, you know, yeah. if you, it just keeps compounding the longer and more consistent you are years wise, the easier it gets to maintain good shape or good muscle yeah. mass. Maintain so, like progressing, you know, past where you oh, are yeah. is increasingly difficult, which I think is what people kind of forget. It's like, you know, <laughs> if you've been in the gym a long time, you really have to kind of press uh, to optimize outward in a different direction and, and stimulate growth. Otherwise, it's like, it is a lot easier, though, to maintain whatever mass you've built within that uh, time in the gym. Yeah, just like my great-grandfather. I mean, he died when he was 90-something years old, year, like a long time ago. But I remember as a kid, he had these really, like, meaty forearms because he was always working with his hands and stuff. And he didn't work out. He's like, you know, 90 years old. He stopped working, you know, labor. He's had these muscular forearms. Yeah. And it's because of all the labor. He So I'm, I'm wondering if there was, like, a bunch of hyperplasia that happened there. It just sticks around. Sure. You know, afterwards. So. All right, everybody, Cyber Monday sale ends tomorrow. That's why I'm about to do a crazy giveaway. Oh, also, by the way, the Cyber Monday sale is 60% off all MAPS workout programs and all MAPS workout program bundles. So if you want to take advantage of that, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Cyber Monday. That sale ends tomorrow. Here's the giveaway that I'm going to do for this episode. The MAPS Super Bundle. It's the biggest bundle that we offer. One of you will get it for free. You have to leave a comment below. Uh, in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode in order to qualify. You also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And if you win, we'll let you know in the comments. Everybody else, again, Cyber Monday ends tomorrow. 60% off everything at mapsfitnessproducts.com with the code Cyber Monday. All right, here comes the show. Anyway, so more interesting stuff I've been reading, uh, I was reading over the weekend. Um, so you guys know what NSAIDs are, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Yeah. So these are like- Tylenol, Advil? No, not Tylenol. So ibuprofen, ibuprofen which is yeah. Advil. Okay, Advil. Uh, naproxen, that's Aleve. Um, aspirin, which is the, the old school classic. And there's other ones out there as well. Tylenol is not. Uh, acetaminophen is a, is a different class yeah, of drugs. That's why you can kind of one to the other, like go back and forth. Well, I was reading about, so I, I ate a bunch of, I had a real big dinner one night and I went and took some Alka-Seltzer which mm -hmm. is old, it's old, you know, over-the-counter medicine for whatever. And in alka Sessor's aspirin. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, aspirin's been around for a long time. We've been using this forever. I wonder what the studies say on aspirin in comparison to the other NSAIDs, like ibuprofen, which is more one of the more widely used ones, right? And did you guys know that aspirin is... Now, for pain relief, this is where you get, like, oh, ibuprofen might last longer, might be a little better, or whatever. But when it comes to like safety and health profile and stuff like that, I, I, aspirin superior. Yeah, well, aspirin isn't it superior. Recommended to have like a baby aspirin a day just for heart health for yes. people who've had yeah. uh, heart attacks or stroke. And don't they even uh, for for pregnant women? Don't they have them take baby aspirin too? I, I thought, don't know about that. Yeah, I thought Katrina got recommended baby aspirin at one point. That's interesting. Yeah, I so. don't know that. But so aspirin's got anti-cancer effects. Hmm. It's got anti-stroke effects, uh, and it can prevent heart attack in certain people, whereas other NSAIDs actually can cause wow. problems or increases in strokes and heart disease. Now, 
So is, I mean, aspirin obviously isn't like as impactful on the liver than in, in terms of it processing it. Cause that's like the big detriment of ibuprofen. So right? all the negative stuff that, that, that they've said about aspirin, like, oh, it increases, it could, it could increase your risk of gastric bleeding or ulcer. It's all true for all the NSAIDs. It basically, in other words, all the negatives are similar, but aspirin has way more positives. Huh. In fact, check this out. So the way that NSAIDs work is they block uh, these prostaglandins that promote inflammation. And there's two main ones. I think one's called uh, COX-1 and the other one's called COX-2. Aspirin does not prevent nitric oxide production like ibuprofen does. In other words, if you're an athlete, uh, you want nitric oxide, ibuprofen is going to reduce it, whereas aspirin does not. So it's really crazy. And I'm like, why, why are we being told, why have, you know, are we all using these other ones instead of aspirin? Because aspirin's around for a hundred years. Yeah. Cheaper. Bro. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's blocking cheap. all the cocks. It's been, <laughs> bro, did you just, that's blocking all the cocks. It was a little just, late, but hey, I still had to land it. I said, hey, when I said it to him, I'm like, let's see if they you jump see on it. see Jesse gets it. One, yeah, two, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hey, yeah. <laughs> 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 gotta no. say it. <laughs> no, it mainly works on the first one, not the second. I'm not going to say the name anymore, Jesse. <laughs> okay. Hey, right. speaking of words like that, so <laughs> yeah. Max, uh, Max has got this, uh, this new, this app that you put, there's a good app by the way that I think is really cool. I don't know if you're if a really or not. It's called PBS for kids, and it's like games that they mm. can play. And but they're uh, educational, I'm uh, assuming. Yeah, they're okay. more they're more on the educational. Uh, it's uh, totally educational, right? Teaches them shapes and colors, and okay. he's really into this cooking thing right now, right? So he and it, basically what it does is. You know, it, it guides them into picking a pot that they cook in, and then you open the fridge, the seasoning, put yeah. it in there. Yes, and, yeah, yes. I saw him do that. That's cute. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, he's all, he's all into it, and he's uh, hilarious. And so, uh, I finally found. I don't know why this is so funny to me. I guess <laughs> as a dad, one of the things I looked forward to is the day that my son can't pronounce something and it becomes a swear word. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this. It's like favorite, it, it's dude. like you know, innocent fun that you like get it's to the have. Best, you know dude. what I'm saying? So. And we're doing it, and uh, and we get to uh, the food's parsley, right? And I saw, of course, I'm like, that's parsley. And so he goes to say it, oh, pussy. And, so <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I so have you're to. Making your a eyes making it's like, and like, Katrina's yeah. in the kitchen cooking some of that. She's like, <laughs> what are you having him say? It's parsley, honey. That's not if she wants some parsley. I want pussy. <laughs> I want pussy. <laughs> It's, yes. it's an educational app. Yeah, so he what? can't he can't pronounce and parsley. What does daddy like to eat? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know why it's well, so I, think, I, I don't know why it's so funny and immature for me to do uh, that. But then you dude. just play with it, bro. Yeah. I, I would yeah. I would tell him like if you want to mess with one of your buddies, I'd be like, hey, I his already, nickname I, is parsley. I, I, I'm already we'll doing parsley. it. I'm yeah, already yeah. doing it. <laughs> so Aurelius Aurelius says he can't say truck. He says fuck. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And he also, when he says sit, it sounds like shit. Yeah. Okay. So we're eating. My kids are like that. They say shit down. Yeah. So we're <laughs> so like, shit down. We're eating breakfast yesterday. We went yeah. out to breakfast. Uh, Jessica's mom was visiting and we're all sitting there and my son wants to watch. He's like infatuated with trucks. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to see this truck video. He wants to be pull up a truck video. So we're, he's sitting there. We're all sitting there and I'm standing up and Aurelius goes, Papa, shit, fuck. Shit, fuck. Papa, shit, fuck. <laughs> and the waitress is like looking at my son. I'm like, he's trying to say sit truck. Yeah. He's not saying shit. She's like, okay, because I thought he was going off. Yeah. I'm like, no, we don't teach him that, okay? <laughs> shit, fuck, Papa. Yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's the best. Yeah, dude. I don't know why. I don't know why I think it's so funny, but I remember, I remember having my little siblings when they were growing up. And then, you know, and I feel like uh, every kid has a, a word or two that they just can't pronounce of very course. well. And they're, they're, they seem to be different, you know, and unique and you never know what it's going to be. And so I had no idea part parsley. Well, the worst is that wait, well, when he hears <laughs> everybody parsley, laugh, he's going to start saying it more. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So, so Aurelius is like full on, it's like a light switch turned off. As soon as he turned two years old, boom, toddler mode. Okay. Mm -hmm. So loud, like if you've ever had, anybody who's ever had toddlers, you know, they can definitely be, there's a stereotype of a toddler where they're very emotional like, you know, he'll, he'll be playing with his car and he gets stuck and he'll lose his shit. And I'll go over there and be like, let me help you. No. And he's yeah. like, just, it's just yeah. hilarious. Okay. So anyway, Jessica, you know, she's, I, I'm, I'm in the other room and I hear her talking to him and she uses this nice voice, but I can also, I can tell she's pissed off yeah. with him. So she goes, she goes to him, she goes, Aurelius. Cause I guess he had water in his sippy cup and he was like splashing her with it in her face. So she's, she goes, Aurelius. 
if you splash mommy in the face one more time, I'm going to be really pissed off. And I'm like in the back. <laughs> oh, I better jump in. Oh, <laughs> she's, she's got the nice yeah, voice, you know, going, yeah. Yeah. but I can hear the anger. Underneath yeah. it. I, was, I was cracking dude. up, dude. Oh, oh it was funny. I was driving up to uh Truckee to kind of spend time with my family. We did an early like Thanksgiving and we're driving up. And this is for Adam, because I wanted to uh, hear you're into rims and everything, and you've seen kind of the progression of that, right? We've seen some really like r- bizarre ones. Yeah, remember like, when spitters? Spinning. Remember Dude, spitters were big? I deals? was wondering about is that still like no. around? Is anybody because that was so ridiculous? It was they'd like stop a, and they keep going. It was like a five year five year trend that they were so popular, and then they fell out of favor. Yeah. I never liked them. I, I thought they always looked. So I'm wondering, cheesy. is this a trend or is this like just a one off that like this guy just had this harebrained idea? Idea. Uh, he was in this like red Corvette, and I look over. I'm like, wait a minute, those are kind of a, a weird color, and they were like a little bit kind of yellow, a little bit greenish, and and then you know we kept driving next to him, and then it got dark, and they started glowing in what? the dark, God. and I was what? like, glow in the dark rims, and really? Like, yeah, I was that's like, kind of cool actually. I mean, no, no I just, I was like, that's kind of cool. <laughs> I was Doug, pull me up some glow in the dark rims. Damn it, I don't know, that's kind of cool. Bro. Don't Listen, do this. If Listen, you saw it, you'd be like, oh, okay, it sounded like a cool idea, but I don't think he pulled it off. Glow in the dark yeah. rims. I mean, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it was glow definitely. No, it's not. Oh, I think that's kind of cool. I want to see what they look like. I mean, I got glow in the dark shoes. I wish I had taken a picture. Yeah, dude, I, yeah, think I, I just did. picture you getting out and you've got the shoes that light up while you're walking. I do through. have the shoes that light up like that. <laughs> did yeah. you? Uh, well, they're the ones I brought in here the other day and I showed you. Oh, those, they did. those Yeezys, the bottoms of them. Yeah, but those if are anybody money. could pull, I figured well, yeah, like, it'd well, be in your wheelhouse for sure. No, so, no. You never yeah. got the ones that, remember the ones that were popular with kids? No, with the they kids. No, no, no. Those, the, and, uh, those, those are cool, though. I mean, you see. Hey, the, did you ever get the shoes that with a little skate in the bottom? No, I didn't get oh, Yeezys. That was the wheelies. Those are our, those are like our, like our, your kids' generation. That wasn't when we were kids. They didn't have those. They didn't have some that were worth having. One of my favorite <laughs> Instagram accounts was this guy. Like he would, he had the wheelies, and he'd, he'd go to skate parks and do tricks and be like, shh. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> died, dude. I don't remember shoes. his name. I, I had a, a I had out. a boss that wore them. Yeah. So when I was, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, when I was 20, this, he'd skate around the gym. He did. He's a fitness manager that used to that used to wear them, and he was like in his mid 20s or late 20s, and he used to rock those. Oh, God, they were they were probably with kids at that time. So I never I thought I did not think it was cool. Like when he was doing it. Now what? Like, so how did those work? <laughs> Like, do can you accidentally can the skate pop out on accident while you're trying to do something fall down, or do you have to like purposely? I mean, yeah, you guys you know to, how they work. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah you yeah, lift they have your a, toes they have a, up, right? So yeah, well, so I mean, your your heel is elevated by a wheel. The wheel is is built it's into in the, the heel in the heel, and it's it's sticking. But out you have on. to physically pop it out and lock it. No, like, it stays. Words, no, it's it like stays that. there on an axle yeah. always, and you have to. So, so you like, just still the walk on your toes. Yeah, you, you still. You it's just to... like having a, 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 a very slight height. Because I'm just picturing like you're, some dudes like carrying groceries up up his what? driveway. Yeah. Oh, there's the there's a the oh, dark. It's rims. a thing. Damn. You don't want to do that, bro. That's so dumb. <laughs> yeah. That's so. Dumb. That's it's like just the, during the day. It looks like shit, dude. I'll be honest. That's like the the. Peak well, look at the of, look at the. I like the ones that are black with the black with the just the lip that's green right there. Oh yeah. Click on those ones, Doug. Okay. I would do that. I would. I would rock those <laughs> right there. I would, Stop I would, it. I would fucking no. rock those. Hey, have I you seen? You. Have you? Have yeah, you those see, ones right there. Oh, oh those right, are like right. bike tires. Oh, those are like bike that tires. That looks so dumb. Have you seen the new? I think it was a BMW. <laughs> where you have the app. I think the key does this, either the key or an app on your phone, and you can change the paint with a touch of a button. Yeah, is that out yet? I don't know, but yeah. somebody sent me a clip. And I'm like, this is crazy. How does that work? I don't so know. The, so yeah. the whole the whole um, is like a digital screen. The car is like a digital screen. So it's not like a normal, like it's, you know, like a, when you go like, I mean, like I'm th- you know, I on buildings, you know, so on buildings like, have like, yeah. they have like LED, like mini LED through the whole thing. I think that's what, how, how so I don't they know. wrap the whole car. In yeah, there? there it is right there. Yeah. That's it. And right it there. goes from white to black. What the heck? <laughs> that's crazy. Now, I don't know if it's a concept or it's actually out. I think it might be a concept. That right looks now. like the new. They, they do some crazy stuff. For that looks like cars. the new X. Yeah. There's, BMW's coming out with a new, I think it's called X or something like that. Looks pretty sick, but maybe. So basically, you break a law, you hit a button, your car changes, get away. Is, <laughs> yeah. that, what, is that what we're going to do? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I remember the uh, there was like some uh, somebody installed something where you could lift your license plate up. And oh. just, oh, yeah, or great. another one comes, yeah. uh, comes uh, across. Like have that. you guys some seen, gangsters okay, out there. you know how you get the, like if you, sometimes you get a picture of your license plate if you don't pay like a toll or something like that. Mm-hmm. There's these covers that you could buy. I don't think they're legal. But they go over your license, your your license plate, and when you look at it normally, you could read your license plate. But if it's at a particular angle where these cameras take a picture, oh, wow. it'll blur it out. 
Oh, cool. So they'll, you'll, they'll take a picture of it and they won't have your license. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. You're I love it. underground tech. You're totally going to buy yeah. that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys, I always get tickets. Hey, so, okay. So since we're talking about like asshole things that I spend money on, so I, I, I spent <laughs> a bunch of money this weekend on, uh, on a new couch. So you told me about it. This is crazy. So yeah, you're hyping it up, but dude, I didn't get any pictures. Love, love sack has, well, I haven't got it yet. They have to, cu oh. they customly make it. Right. So it's getting all done right now. I get it like in two weeks. So I'll definitely like show you guys once I get it. So love sack has partnered with Harman Kardon and Harman Kardon is like top of the line. Yeah, like stereo speakers. systems. They're, they're in some of your, your luxury cars and stuff like that. So it's great, great speakers. So they partnered. And so Harman Kardon has built a, a surround sound system in the love sack couches so i built this sectional that has chases two chases on the end and then i got two chases on the outside underneath i have three subwoofers and then i've got two on each side speakers on the sides and in behind and you can't see anything everything's all hidden in the couch and then you have a centerpiece that's underneath the plasma and it all is connected all wild now you were saying wow. because this sounds Sick. it sounds wild but you tested it yes and you were saying it sounded yeah like so i mean i see so i i saw reviews like uh people that were spec because it's, it's it's pretty new and so i looked up on youtube to find like reviews on what other like someone who owns it they say and i couldn't find anybody who already owned it just people that heard about the tech that it was coming and of course people were speculating oh it's probably going to be muffled oh it's going to be this. that's what i would think because it's inside it the couch. sounds uh, you know what it feels like it feels like i'm wearing headphones what what because you're in the couch and so the sides are here and so it's it hits right you like right so yeah it hits you and makes you feel like you're got you got headphones on so what's huh. cool and the, so what really sold me on this is so katrina we have we have pretty good surround sound already at the house and katrina's always getting on to me to turn it down oh max turn it down turn it down turn it down time like fuck what's i got all these badass speakers but it is kind of loud especially the upstairs one that's near his room. So I don't get to really blast it the way I want to because it, it makes the whole house loud where this is going to be like the couch is more focused. It's more focused. And so I don't need to crank it up as high and it won't be as loud right outside of. So I'm really excited. And love sack, you know how comfortable love sack oh, yeah. stuff is. So the couch yeah. is unbelievably comfortable and the whole thing. It's called stealth tech. Yes. Oh shit. And the whole thing. And it's all Bluetooth. It, yes. All Bluetooth. And the whole entire couch is machine washable. Oh, so sick. the that's, side that's the, important. Dude. Oh yeah, with kids, <laughs> kids and dogs. So the the the, the side panels all uh, the, and you can't tell. So you would never guess that the you can unvelcro the the couch and actually unzip the cushions. It yeah. looks like a normal sectional couch. Now are they like wow. are they really expensive? Are they kind of expensive? What's what is what is. <laughs> Let's just what say, your, what's your definition? Love of sack on top of having tech built into the love. Like, come on. Well, like a couch, a nice couch would cost like four grand, like a really nice couch. So, yeah. like, it's yeah. way more or than like that. 10. Yeah. yeah. Way more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. By the look on your face. Yeah. And, it's and knowing you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's not, it's not cheap at all. Now, mind you, I did get a, like, you could get it for, uh, you could get something smaller. I got a whole setup, right? So I have, mm -hmm. and I built it to where I had the chase because I like the chase. And then I got on each end chase, and then I you gonna, gonna put Max in it and turn on Paw Patrol? Let's look at the look at the look on his face. <laughs> I, I'm, I've always got him. Dad, on the, this is great. Katrina, yeah. Katrina's the one that doesn't like the doesn't like the stuff loud. She's always turning everything down all the time. And I'm like, oh my. Do God, you have to watch things with subtitles with her? No, she that's how I watch them. Well, she hates subtitles. So, okay, yeah, so she you won't. just can't hear it and see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's how I watch yeah. it because Jessica's like that too. Turn it down, turn it down. So uh, I'm like subtitles. Yep. Okay, I guess I'm reading TV today. I, you know, as a kid, <clears throat> I was into that stuff really young. My, in fact, my first big purchase as a kid when I was in my uh, early teens, when I was first starting work, I saved up enough to buy like a home stereo system. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been into loud music, into surround sound on TV, move, and I've always been into movies. I collected cassettes, then I collected yeah. DVDs. Like, <clears throat> so of course, when I grew up, you know, that's you, I, you never grew out of some things. That's one of the things I never grew out of, and mm -hmm. and now you. Well, I what mean, it is is it's immersive. I'm like that yeah. too. I like to be immersed. Me too. When I I'm watching something, yeah. I just don't do it anymore because kids and all that stuff. But I love it. I love if I'm watching a good movie. <laughs> I want to yeah. be. I still get loud, but I got to be downstairs. That's like you know, you go downstairs if you want to uh, play your raucous right, music. I got nowhere, like, bro. My whole house. I can't even work out in the garage. <laughs> I can't work out in the garage. I can't. Bro, watch you need TV a man loud. cave, dude. You need to. Figure it's all right. It out. I've accepted it, bro. I got four kids. I'm gonna have four kids here, so. <laughs> that's a, my well, house. No, I bring the kids down there with me, and we we rock out. Hundred percent. If and when the time comes when I do a build, like I will build a 
like separate a, man cave, hundred yes. percent. That's like in the basement, totally. concrete wall. Yes. Yeah, I can play it as loud as I want. Yes, like, that's like I'll a, drop goals. weights, do whatever yeah. the hell I want. Yes, totally. Yes, hundred percent. That's that's, that's, all, that's on my dude, on my list. For speaking sure. of family, dude, I got this is this always this is just hilarious. I just noticed something. So I'm on this big family group thread with like aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, whatever. It's a huge one, right? And uh, man, who's do you guys have like a biggest fan? Do you, you guys have someone in your in family, your family? Like your biggest fan? Oh yeah, yeah. I said, so that's my I mom. No fans, no shame. Anything I share, <laughs> would you say? <laughs> I got no fans. Anything I share, it's I'll share anything at all, and my mom will always love it. She'll always heart it and say something like, "That's amazing, son." Oh, that's so sweet. That's the greatest thing. That's so sweet. And I just noticed the other day, I sent like a meme or something like that, and and I saw like a heart and like this comment, and I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. it's only my mom that's liking my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else is lucky. She's our biggest fan. We got started. She's Remember, we had like two yeah. people listening. I know. You, yeah. Who, who, Thanks, okay. Do you have do you have family that listens? Yeah. Like, I mean, like, like really listens, like not like really uh, listens. Like checks be, in. Honestly, it's on. Uh, I would say probably more on Courtney's side, uh, like her sister. Or her oh, brother. interesting. Yeah. So yeah, my uh, like so my parents will listen to like when we do like certain interviews with people that they're interested in, and that's about it. Uh, but like mm. Courtney would be like the next one I would say probably listens yeah. the most. Yeah, I, I she to, used to not. So that's, she didn't. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's why I've been so like carefree about what I talk about. So if you're not gonna listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roast you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. I now, a, I now a, she listens. You yeah. I've got a, I have a handful of family. I mean, what my sister doesn't count because she works for the company, right? But she was she's been since day one. She's been a listener yeah. and a fan even before she worked for the company. I have my my cousin Stephanie. Shout out to her. You guys have oh, yeah, met her, her before yeah, I up love in her. Seattle, right? So yep. she listens to damn near episode. She's great. My uncle John, he listens. So shout out to Uncle John. He listens to like almost every episode. He's always commenting. Um, and then my mom's husband Lonnie. Shout out to Lonnie. He always listens too. But my mom yeah. doesn't listen. So. I, well, I have to. Okay, so I have to be clear. Like Jessica, by far, is, is the she listens to every. In fact, she has uh, mm. people from Mind Pump send her the episodes before the air. Was she a fan before yes. you guys started dating? Yeah, yeah 100%. Wow. Well, no. Yes, she was, actually. When yes, I first was. met her, I had her subscribe to Mind Pump, because you guys remember how aggressive we were in the early days. Oh, yeah. We yeah, grabbed yeah. people's phones and just subscribed them. <laughs> That's right. You grabbed her yeah, phone. Yeah, let me your phone real quick. Yeah. Boop, you're subscribed. I remember that now. She was already yeah. subscribed. She No, she wasn't. She uh, became a fan. In fact, she told me that when she first funny. listened, at first she thought it was pompous, and I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> And she's like, I still think that. All right, anyway. But she uh, she still she hates when we refer to uh, Mind Pump, right? Is it how we refer to Mind Pump like third person? Yeah, yeah <laughs> dude. But, she, but no, she she gets the episodes early, listens to every single one. She's my best critic because she's very honest. Yeah. But then, yeah, it's my mom. She cracks me up because she'll listen too sometimes. That's sweet. And I'll know because she'll, she'll, every once in a while, she'll say something like, Oh, that joke you made. Uh, that was kind of little. I don't know if I like that joke. I'm like, what, mom? You're listening? Uh. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. My parents support, but they're like, you know, they, it makes them too uncomfortable. I think like the subject matter we bring up. Oh. You know? Anyway, yeah, so I got this interesting speculation. I'd like your. I, in fact, I thought about you, Adam, because you you tend to speculate on this stuff a lot. Okay. So the more and more products and eventually entertainment will get produced by AI and machines and computers. Do you think that at some point a label on a product that says human made is going to make something more yep. valuable and more expensive? 100%. You do. I 100%. I mean, and it's all going to be good, right? So I think that so many things are going to be created and made by AI and it's going to lower lower the entry for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. things that maybe you could It's like afford. mass production. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you like uh, shoes are example, right? I, we're not far, I think, from being able to 3D print sneakers and shoes. And so people who want to have a certain look that looks like certain shoes or whatever, they can get them for relatively cheap. Like that, I think uh, in the future, right? Obviously, a 3D printer is expensive and it's not, yeah. we're not there, but we will get there at one point. And then what I think will be, and, and there'll still be a market for, very high, and it'll be human-made stuff, handcrafted yeah. stuff. I think that we're going to see the comeback of right. of things like that, things that are handmade or a, an artist There's actually- There's a video of them actually forging things. No, and, totally. I, yeah. just, I You know why I agree with you? So I was thinking about this. Uh, so Ferrari, obviously uh, one of the, the most expensive car brands. It's got a crazy lineage in history. They they yeah. advertise that that yeah. their, That's their right. cars handmade. are it's a big selling handmade, point. hand stitched. You see this with uh, uh, instruments. You see, so this with, you see this with watches. You see it with watches, instruments yeah. like there's guitars, there's uh, you know there's trumpets, there's violins that are the most expensive ones are the ones that are made 
handmade. That's and that's so, a, and it's all in these art. It's no different. It is no different than yeah. how it really is today. The only difference is that AI is is going to be able to it, open up uh, the opportunity for people that couldn't afford certain things before. Well, now and the car example is a perfect example. Obviously, not everybody can afford a Ferrari, but most people can afford somewhat of a car at, at this yeah. point now. Car, cars, are, you can get a pretty cheap car today. And because they what they mass produce them in factories and everything, and so that is one hundred percent how I think AI is going to happen. Music we're going to get reproduced, and you're going to see it. Do you guys think it's going to be like that with meat? Do you think that we're going to see steak and it's be like this is from a real cow, not lab grown? Meat? <laughs> I mean, aren't we seeing that like, right now? They'll show a picture of the cow. Like, oh, cool. <laughs> it's like grass-fed beef versus beyond meat right yeah, now. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the, the already the the divide. There's people that I'm are, talking about lab-grown meat though, because yeah. they can actually take stem cells, yeah. and at some point they'll be able to print or make steak. Like here's your steak. It was right. grown in a lab. It's it was never a cow. Like I wonder if it's going to be like that. Like I only eat meat that's from actual animals. Yeah. I want to eat lab. I want a whole montage of its life. You know, the <laughs> grazing and the, you <laughs> know, have a picture of it. <laughs> you buy a video and then it. like Sarah McLaughlin before it's ended. Well, <laughs> oh. you know, you know what's funny. Oh, you know what's funny about that is that like PETA activists uh, will actually they they actually did this at one point. They they put name tags on steaks. Like this, this cow was Bessie. This cow was whatever. Uh, uh -huh. I'm like, that might actually sell more steaks in the future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was a real cow. You know yeah, what I mean? mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I got a kick out of the Coca-Cola when the Coca-Cola had your name on it. Something uh, like that. Yeah, so it's kind of like the same thing. Your you know cow what though? Name on it. Growing up with an, with an ethnic name like me, nothing ever had my name on it. No keychains, no wallets, uh, yeah. no nothing. You go to yeah. Grand Canyon and you're just screwed. Yeah. I'd go through, oh, there's Sally. I can yeah. get Sally if I want. There's never Sal. Or Selena. I never saw <laughs> Sally. I never that's saw that's Sal. Like, Sally what Sally again? So, yeah, it's, it's so annoying. Hey, are you guys uh, are you guys um, completely avoiding the stock market? Has anybody bought yes. any stocks? No, I none. I, I don't want to look. I'm, I bought some stocks. Yesterday. I know you've yeah you've been kind of promoting. I am. Few. Well, you know, what's well, down, dude? He's doing the right thing. Yeah, no, yeah, too, I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm just I yeah. I'm so like well, slow I, I get asked all the time about a new. So basically, I've been I've been uh, averaging down on all the stocks I already had. So that's I'm not doing any. But I did buy a new stock. Actually, you know what stock I bought yesterday? What? Uh, I bought it for Max too. So I think this is a uh, Krispy Kreme donut. Really? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Look at Doug's laughing at me. He's terrible. Bye. All right. You know who they just partnered up with? Who? McDonald's. Oh, no. Krispy Kreme Donuts coming into 400,000 locations. That's a duh. Go pull my ticker up there, Doug, while you're laughing. Blood money. Pull my, pull my ticker <laughs> Wait, up. hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> He's just laughing because we're a fitness podcast. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. so Adam's, Adam's got a portfolio of yeah. Marlboro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do have Marlboro. <laughs> you do? I wasn't making it up. <laughs> He's got I'm hedging my bets. He's I'm going to try and save everybody. all your lives. I'm going to try and save. But I can't. I'm still going to make some money. I know a lot of you guys are <laughs> taking your time to make that good decision. So wow. Yeah, no problem wow. out of it. So it's, uh, Krispy the ticker huh? is Donut. It's Donut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I'm know gonna, what, though? Are you guys fans of Krispy? I never like Krispy. I, 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 I understand I was, why people, It was so oh. in the bodybuilding community. It's huge. It's good. Are you kidding me? It's, I mean, not, it's, it's not as good I'm as I'm not a big Donut guy, but like, yeah, they were popular when I was out in Chicago. And it was like, it's just because, if especially it's fresh. And it's just like, yeah. it's they've mastered whatever glaze, you know, like, it's just like the perfect balance. I don't know. I don't like it. I like regular old Winchell's or. Yeah, I, wa I want to go to a Donut place that looks grungy and dirty and an old Asian lady comes out at yes. four, four o'clock in the morning. Yes. And I mean, I can get down with that. That like is like a good a, maple a, bar. Bro, yeah. there's the one yeah. over yeah. there by the 24. Yeah, she has to sleep in the place. Yes. She wakes up at four o'clock in the and morning. And if they don't just serve donuts, they no. also make sandwiches and barbecue. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's the place yes. that makes the best. Yes. You know exactly what I'm yes. talking about. Right. They got a fry machine that is the best that they got to use for a lot of donut you can get a hold of right there. How are we doing over there, Doug? Oh, we're down today. Yeah. We're down today. Yeah. It's not a bad buy. The only stocks that crush Adam are the ones you talk about but don't buy. You're in a, it's like a weird. Exactly. I don't know, though. I like so. I mean, I just threw a couple bucks at it from Max's portfolio. But more than anything else, I was actually just interesting in the merger, right? Isn't that an interesting partnership? No, it's totally It makes a lot of sense. Brilliant. Did you know, isn't McDonald's crushing right now what their adult Happy Meals? Have you guys been reading about this? So I know they did it. I don't know if they are crushing from it or not. Uh, they how, were they were they were crushing. How's McDonald's stock doing right now? Are they doing all right? So they, uh, I mean, <clears throat> I think right now is when the the big monopoly game hits. Right? Is that happening, or did I, did I miss that boat? I don't know. I, yeah. I don't go to McDonald's enough to know that stuff. Oh, McDonald's is crushing two seventy four right now. Jeez, they always do well. They did get like little prizes in their Happy Meals, right? That was the like, adult ones. Yeah, yeah, like a weird thing. It was, but people collect them, and they're they got weird. You know what's funny? I don't remember. I saw this a long time ago. There was this an analysis of McDonald's customers and there's a sizable percentage. I don't remember what the number was, but it was significant 
percentage of their customers that are such regular users that they can count on them to come every single day. Wow. They have like a huge chunk, a base of people that are like McDonald's every single day. I've never heard that. Yes. Interesting. Yes. And it's that's like one of the keys of their success is they have this like crazy loyal- They all live in Ohio for some reason. Where? I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> just, just trying to throw a random one out Hey, there. did you start your speech? You just brought up Ohio. So you made yeah. me think about the uh, your Graham Hancock. Yes. I watched, watch it. I watched, I watched it. Yes. I've been going through it. I've been Fascinated going through it. quite a bit of it right now. There's, did you see the Ohio serpent or snake? Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't see yes. that. Yes. Yeah. The mound that's up there. Yeah, that's why yeah, I was created. There's a lot of those. Uh, I'm just getting excited about uh, the new discovered pyramids that were like ter like terraces yeah. that, that are on the side of mountains that, that, well, what sucks about it too is like they're, they're kind of protected. And uh, there was one in Mexico too that's apparently the biggest pyramid in the world yeah uh but there's like some kind of like a um church um that's on top that they had built so they can't excavate uh -huh. which is really frustrating because they've excavated kind of the bottom of it and there's all these perfectly cut stones and you know they've, they've been able to kind of go in and, and they see all these like i don't know how many tunnels there are but there's just tunnel systems everywhere and it's there were, it would be so revealing if they could like excavate the whole so, thing so, so his whole it's it's the <laughs> say that for me Quetzalco yeah, yeah Quetzalcoatl 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 so that was the their Fair one enough. like um the the one figure that was like kind of like a Jesus figure that like taught him how to uh <clears throat> That's create the myth. yeah civilization and all that the myth like so, him and like Veracocha was so his one. whole premise which I think is a very reasonable premise his whole premise is that human civilization is not as linear as we think. Like well, we think of it as starting here and then improving. But what he's saying is we've been on earth for a long time and there probably was lots of progressions and then wiping out a civilization because of cataclysmic So events. Katrina was trying to ask me, she right. goes, what is the, what's the controversy around him, right? Because he obviously has all these archaeologists. Yeah. That, so what well, I said to her, and you, uh, you guys can tell me, build on it or correct me, uh, is we have our our theory on how man evolved is basically that we were kind of dumb cavemen way back when, thousands of years ago right and mm -hmm. you got stuff yeah, hunter gatherer only really. yeah. yeah and so when stuff like this starts coming out and then dating back maybe way, way further back than way me. further back and, the, and, the, back and and it aligns with the stars and i mean it's just like these guys had to been a lot smarter than what we think yeah. they were back then. And that's kind of controversial based off of what, how they're we, discovering all these ancient megalithic structures, like underwater, under oceans. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. points back to ice age, ice age, because the, the oceans were, you know, a lot of it was absorbed yeah, pre flood, pre flood stuff, right. Too. Ice and, and the big, you know, uh, glacial structures. And so it's like, it, there's just so much history that still, needs to be uncovered in the thing about archaeology. It's like they've created an entire um, timeline based off of like what they've been able to discover in the past. But now these kind of interrupt that timeline. And so they have to kind of throw it out and be flexible and go back and revisit based on new evidence. And, and it seems like there's a lot of resistance, which uh, what I heard in the documentary, which I thought was interesting is that, you know, you know, uh, archaeology and what's this what's the study of the stars i can't think of astrology astrology, astrology thank you so archaeology astronomy astronomy, astronomy. astronomy. thank you astronomy is the fucking <laughs> horoscope <laughs> stuff <laughs> so astronomy right now i'm sorry astronomy yeah. and archaeology don't really communicate to each other is that correct that's i mean and so that's what's interesting about this now, now the reason why this is important is because so much uh, of these ancient historical artifacts were designed to line up with well, yeah. So uh, astronomy is like the 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 worldwide language that we all spoke before language, mm. right? I mean, was the ability to look up the stars and notice that there's patterns yeah, and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And so a lot of this stuff is pointing to that. And then the archaeologists they don't they don't utilize any of that. They're purely off of like carbon dating and yeah. like what this structure is made right. of. In and terms of the alignments, like what, yeah, like where they pointed specifically uh, to to different like uh, what do they call those like different like seasons and things that come through? I forget what the names of are, but yeah, like the equinox, the equinox, or the um, yeah. There's there's a few of those solstice, solstice yeah. summer solstice, like. So yeah, they're finding a lot of those structures were were pointed very specifically to to align with these different uh, star structures. I mean, it's very it's it sounds very reasonable to me yeah. that that it would be very easy for uh, civilizations to get erased after cataclysmic events. You know, when you're talking about ten thousand years ago, twenty thousand yeah. years ago, like we're not going to have really remnants of 
you know, what they did. And yes, there probably were lots of, and there definitely were lots of hunter gatherers, but they could have existed simultaneously yeah. as more advanced. Now, adults. do we, do we, do we build things today that we intend, like if case this were to happen again, an ice age were to come oh, again? They're going to see our shit for thousands of years, bro. We got plastic. <laughs> they're going to find plastic water bottles and shit. Be like, this ancient civilization. <laughs> they just had a bunch of containers. Whoa, you know, just Legos they're like putting together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is what they built their houses off of. Because it's like, cause they're plastic Legos and everything yeah. else. You know? So yeah, our shit ain't going away then. No, bro. Yeah. Well, Unfortunately, yeah. they're going to... We've made a lot of uh, stuff that doesn't biodegrade yeah. very well. So mm. anyway, interesting. Yeah. All right. So uh, more cool studies I'll bring up. Um, I just read a cool study on red light therapy. So lot of, you guys know that red light therapy can help with healing and recovery. And there's studies to support this. I just read a study that showed that it reduced uh, joint pain by 50% in, in people who used it. 50%. What? That's very, very significant. Wow. They also had another one on Achilles tendon pain, and there was a significant reduction in pain as well. Really? So this is yeah. So how long was the usage? Uh, they did it for uh, I want to say uh, ninety days, I believe. I'd have to go double double, double check. Now, but I mean, you, that's when, like the, there's like nothing does yeah, that. That's yeah, it's crazy. And it's natural. It's big. Yeah, it's natural. Nothing does that, and it's pro recovery and healing, not anti healing, like a lot of you know um, anti inflammatory. Now, when you read something like that, like, what is what does that point to for you as far as like what is what's going on for to have that powerful of an impact? The well, mitochondria is that yep. that does that mean that it's that impactful? Yep, yep. Oh. It literally supercharges the mitochondria and they produce more collagen, more uh, <clears throat> what are they called fibroblasts, which create the structures of collagen, reduces inflammation because it speeds up the waste removal process. So basically, it's like red light is like fuel for the mitochondria. <clears throat> so when you sh when you you hit them with red light. They operate better and faster, so healing happens faster. You, Inflammation is regulated better, um, and it, it's and the, this this it's crazy. If you look up the study, it sounds like magic. Yeah. If you look up the studies, there there's a lot. It's not like one study. There's a lot of studies. You know, when that you when you talk about yeah. this stuff, I can't help but think that we're heading towards total recall. But well, why? because it was always all it was all red lit up, you know. Uh, and I know they did that because it's, 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 it's on Mars, right? Yeah, but yeah. they it was red lights all over the place too. Yeah. Like, I could you imagine if like the future is instead of us having these fluorescent lights, which we've already proven is not ideal for us, that just we get used to having red lights on us all the time. Well, why well, don't we have different. them in our cars as we commute? Well, that's right. different. Uh, like, yeah, you can overdo it too. So, so oh, you can the actual red light that you would get from like a Juve panel. Um, you could definitely over, that's why they say 20 minutes a day. They don't tell you to use it all day long. You could, uh, over stimulate or you could cause problems if you over, you know, if you use it too much, just regular red lights, not the same. Like we put red light bulbs on. That's not the same thing as. No, I know. But yeah. I mean, the technology that's in Drew, yeah. if it makes its way into your lights in your house, why yeah. would it not do that? Because it's just too much. It would be too much. You, really? you, yeah. You only want to do it focused and you only do a certain period of time. Um, otherwise, it would well, be like cool to have a switch, you know, like you could have a timer where you right, right it. after it's been on for X amount in the day or what. I would think if it's up I in my like ceiling, it's that direction. tall. It's not you're not the same impact as you are standing six inches from a juve light. Yeah, no, I think it'd be too much and probably really expensive. Could you imagine how expensive that would be? Well, it is right ceiling? now. That's before AI makes it for us. Yeah. <laughs> you know now even poor people. It might just be red like light, shower, too. red light, and then like <laughs> cold plunge and heat, so, and then you go to bed. Or that's something. what I've been trying to see. How I, I want to build my juve like hang over me while I shower. Mm, Since yeah. I'm I'm in the shower twice a day every day, and that's a nice little that's like the perfect amount of time. Like I'm trying to find a way to mount it, and then also do it to where like the steam doesn't, doesn't ruin. ruin it. Yeah. So I want, I want to yeah. figure out how to do that to where it's like a just boom, I hit the switch while I'm showering, I'm getting hit with my red light. And then when I'm out then it's, then it's done. Yeah. Cause that's the only thing right now I have to like take the effort to outside of what I already do, which like anything else, when it's not part of your normal routine, it's, it's takes discipline to stay mm -hmm. consistent with it. And I notice a different, I notice a difference on my skin when I'm consistent on it, when I'm consistent yeah. on it, it makes a big difference. But I also notice that if I, if I'm not consistent with it, it's like exercise, got to ritualize it. Yeah. It's somehow. like exercise. You stop yeah. doing it, then you stop getting the effect. Yeah. And then uh, along those lines, um, more health study. So low melatonin production at night has been connected in uh, animals, and they do think this happens to humans as well, to leptin resistance, which then, of course, leads to um, insulin resistance. Mm. So they think that, that this could be contributing to the rise in the, the, the more recent rise in things like 
diabetes is that people are just <clears throat> not getting sleep like they should. They're up on their electronics all night long, not producing mm. enough melatonin. And because of that, they're, they're getting, you know, leptin resistance and insulin resistance as a result. So I think, um, and we made this speculation before, I think blue light blocking glasses are going to be at some point, um, like just ubiquitous. Like everyone's going to have to use them. Yeah. Just because the amount of electronics. You know what's interesting about that is that yeah, I was- I remember when they first came out and the dumb commercials when we were kids and then our parents had them. So that's, yeah. it's not like this is like super new technology. It's not like it's no. super new science. But they we, promoted more for driving, I think. It was. Yeah. That's, a, that's exactly what it was. It was the bright lights that were getting, you were hitting at nighttime. They, they would tell you to wear it. They were actually telling you, promoting you to wear it at night. Yeah, yeah um, you're driving with this late at night. Yeah, yeah these, <laughs> this, <honestly. laughs> it's probably why it didn't last very. Well, long. the new technology with blue light blocking glasses is like what Felix Gray has, which is it's clear it's clear lenses. Because the technology before was you put them on and everything's yellow or orange, and then you look like you know Dave Asprey. Where you're walking. Yeah. Well, I, you know, obviously we knew the value of it back then, or else it wouldn't even hit the mark in the because it, it blew up. They, I'm sure yeah. blue blockers made a, a ton of money back then. They so did. The, so we knew the value and the science back then. The difference is, you know, TVs, computer screens, and phones today. Yeah. We're on them way more now. Yeah. Way more and way closer. You cannot mm-hmm. tell yes. me that staring at that these these phones and these iPads this close. Have you to ever your, seen the meme? You ever seen the meme where you're like, uh, you know, kids in the '90s and our moms are yelling at us for being too close to the TV, and then it's like today. Day, and then they got the VR glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys I remember that, dude. That, that was like the big pitch was like, you can't be too close to the TV. I remember, oh, yeah, as a kid, I got yelled at all the time. Brain. Yeah. My mom would always tell me, scoot back. Yeah. Get close to the TV. Yeah, Go yeah. back. Yeah. Now man. we're like, right yeah. Faces. yeah, we're all in, dude. Yeah, we, we're like, we I want jump. a contact lens that shines the internet in my eyeball. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want any space. Sleep, I mean, do you guys think whatever. that we're so? Uh, I actually was listening to. By the way, okay, so I I promised that I would bring uh, a person to shout out every every qual going forward, and so a recent uh, podcast that I've been listening to uh, is Ryan Pineda has a podcast called The Wealthy Way on YouTube. Um, I watched a couple of interviews already that I really liked, uh, the conversation. So if you're into, uh, he's a real estate house flipper guy. Um, I you don't know him. clip. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Yeah. I sent, That's I sent really you, good. I sent, yeah, I sent you guys over some stuff of, of him talking to, uh, Grant Cardone. They actually got it. What made me think of that and why that came up was that they were talking about metaverse and NFTs and crypto. You guys saw what happened with the FTX, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, that's like Dude. the amount of money that is being, that got lost. There's, in a, that. Mo- there's a little money laundering uh, yeah, I was gonna controversy say around them. <clears throat> more kind of emerging uh, yeah. from that story, right? Yeah. Well, so this, the, the founder, what's his name, Sam, whatever, he, he was basically, you know, uh, almost like a Ponzi scheme. Yep. He was, he had, he owned both companies and he was, did you know, so here's the, they're going to get like a, these crypto companies are going to get so regulated because so if you're a bank, which by the way, okay, I agree. But the irony of that is that was what everybody touted. What was going to be so amazing about this technology it's was decentralized. It's decentralized. Yes. yes. Meanwhile, if you believe it's going to stick around now, almost everybody believes it needs to be regulated by the sec. So it's like, Okay. Yeah, all you need is one of these assholes to ruin it. Which brings me back to my original argument of why I'm going to hang back and wait until I see that which one the government gets behind. Yeah. Because whichever one they get behind is the one that's going to be the most profitable, that's going to do well, it's going to be around forever. If you're a bank, you're, you're not allowed to, or credit union, right? You're not allowed to use your depositors' uh, funds to fund your business. You're not allowed to touch that. Okay? That's a big no-no. It's like you go straight to jail, right? Right. What these crypto companies do, um, if they if they're not labeled as a bank or whatever, is and that's what they did is they funded their com- their business with their depositors' money. Yeah, that's how it was like a Ponzi scheme. Wow, and that's that's, that's a real no no. Yeah, that's real bad. Well, and it just I think it just highlights that was one of the big ones, FTX, right? That was a massive one. You had people like Steph Curry, you had people like Tom Brady that had hundreds of millions of dollars in it, and and it went under like that. But so many of these coins are just grifts, dude. There's you got all these people that are just creating these tokens and you know attaching them to random. It's like, dude, this whole thing is coming up un- undone right we're now. We're gonna make a coin, yeah, yeah. pump coins, pump dude. coins. So I, I just think that we're we're much further away from all of it being integrated the way everybody thought it was going to be. I think that. The metaverse thing is a ways away. I think NFTs are a ways away. Yes, I, I believe in the technology. Yes, I think we're going to use in the future. But again, speculating on what company is the company 
today is like speculating on what company was going to come out of the dot com. I think era. these are. I mean, I think a lot of it's just talking points for these companies. You know, it's like we're doing all these things, and this is what's happening. And like they're they're speaking like it's going to be a couple of years, when in fact I think it's going to be a lot further. Uh, I don't think that they're they're they've quite figured all this stuff out. No, yet. well, there's certain things that it makes a, a ton of sense for, like. I see a lot of value with NFTs with things like houses and watches and cars, like to be able to attach like the ownership. A digital certificate. Yeah. Imagine having a digital certificate to things like a, like a, it'd be so hard to steal a car. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Like things in a watch, like to make sure that, I mean, there's a huge uh, aftermarket uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in the watch game and stuff like that. And to know, to make sure it's authentic, like, mm -hmm. man, they make fake watches really, really good now. Fake shoes really, really good now. It's harder to, but if you had it authenticated by an NFT, yeah. I could see tremendous and disrupting value. ticket master and all that. So <laughs> like uh, artists can basically like run their own, own kind yep. of uh, where, where it business. got crazy to me was when it just like the board eight, uh, you know, the uh, that thing where it turned into this thing where it's like, oh, it's gonna be this community in metaverse, and oh, you know, the, all these famous people are gonna hang together, and if you pay hundreds of thousand dollars, you'll have access to them too. And it's like that to me, that was stupid, like this idea that you know, everybody is gonna like what happens when those people don't, it's not cool anymore, it's what happens when it's like spinners. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. And you spent all your money on hella spinners. You know what I'm saying? Spinners that would be a good idea. Next have thing, man. <laughs> yeah. Glowing Glow in the dark spinners. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> hey, check this out. There's a company called Live On that makes uh, great supplements that utilize liposomal technology so that these nutrients get to the target tissues. And right now, you can get lipoglutathione for free when you bundle it with B complex and vitamin C. Go check this company out. Uh, go to liveonlabs.com. That's L I V O N. LABS.com forward slash MP. All right, here comes the show. First question is from Michael Trendler. How do you target your chest during dips? I only feel my triceps. Oh, yeah. You know, what's interesting about dips is it could become like a, like literally just changing your form <clears throat> can make it like a awesome chest exercise or make it an awesome tricep yeah, exercise. Totally. Changes the emphasis. 100%. Flare, flare the elbows, chest forward. That's it. Lean yeah, forward. Yeah bring the elbows out. And fo so, you know, when you're doing an exercise and you want to hit a target muscle, consider the action of the muscle, right? So the, the action of the chest is to bring the humerus from out here. So that's the upper arm towards the midline of your body. So it's pulling this part of your arm in, not extending the elbow, extending the elbow is a tricep. So you want to focus on that almost like you're trying to squeeze your hands together as you're coming up on like the a dip. decline bench press. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what, what I'm thinking about when I, when I do a dip for my chest, I'm thinking about the same feel of when the bar is being lowered down on a decline on a decline press. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I'm, and you're doing that by leaning the chest forward, flaring the elbows out and and then going really deep too. So getting a nice good stretch on there and you should feel stretch. And then the opposite is true. When you want triceps, you want triceps, you stay more upright and you tuck the elbows in and you stay tight. That's it. So um, it's elbow extension versus uh, what is that? Humeral horizontal um, adduction. But that being said, it, it, it's also important to note, though, too, that it's very much so a tricep exercise, too. So sure. it's like, you know, it's not like you isolate the no. chest and then there's no triceps. Glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's me. you emphasize yeah. one or the other. That's right. What that's it is. that's right. So it's not like, you, you know, know what I really like about dips is it's one of the few chest. Uh, it's also worse the shoulders quite a bit. It's one of the few chest shoulder exercises with where you could really go. I mean, it, it, now under control, right? You have to have good control, good stability. So make sure you train within your parameters of control, which is different from person to person. But you can work up to a really crazy range of motion. I, in fact, I can't yep. think of an exercise where you can really work a range of motion like a dip, where you're putting the chest and the, the, the shoulders in this really crazy yeah. deep stretch. Super um, end range. Which we just potential. talked about at the beginning of the episode, yeah. uh, you know, Muscles in a stretch position, especially under low, they tend to stimulate more muscle growth. And they, they show this with other, when they compare exercises, for example, exercises that put a muscle under stretch tend to build more muscle than ones that don't. I'm not saying that's all you should do because there's value in all of them, but dips are an underrated chest exercise, if you ask me. I really Such think a it's good compliment to, to bench press too, just because you are getting so low there, like, uh, you know, in that sticking point in the chest where I'm at the bottom position and I have to really dig my way out, uh, you know, dips, if you go super low with that, it'll really help to strengthen that part of the lift. 100%. And to me, it's like uh, deficit deads versus conventional deadlifts. Mm. Like you working deficit deads helps you with that in range like that and digging out from the bottom 
where that's kind of the same, same thing when you do dips. You can do dips really deep like mm -hmm. that. helps you dig out the bottom of the, of the, the chest. Uh, yeah, the other thing is that a lot of people don't realize you can load dips. Uh, if yeah. you get a weight belt, safely too. Yeah, if you get a weight belt where you get a bench, so you can stand on a bench, so you're in the kind of top position, and then you can bend your knees or you know clear the bench, so you can go all the way down. You can load around a chain that goes around your waist. It's, what do they call? I think it's called the weight belt. Mm -hmm. You can load the hell out of it. So like a bench press, it could be a really heavy pushing exercise. I mean, I've worked up to close to 150 pounds around my well, waist. Well, what's yeah. cool about that to that point is I feel I favorite. feel safer loading a, a dip dip like that where maybe I might only be able to get two or three reps out yeah. than I would a barbell by myself. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. If I'm doing a barbell bench press by myself, like I'm going to put a weight on there that I feel pretty confident I can get five reps otherwise in. Otherwise you're pinned. Yeah. Otherwise I'm pinned and I have, but with that you can, you can bail a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, that's why I, I actually really like it for going heavy because I feel safer when I'm by myself. Next question is from Ryan L. Noki. Is it better to cut with or without refeeds and cheat days? All right. Yes and no. So here's the yes. The yes is it's better to cut, um, or in other words, it's better to have a calorie deficit, but include days where your your calories are higher, um, maybe even a slight surplus, because this, look it looks like, okay, so there's not a ton of evidence for this, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. It seems like this prevents the, what's called metabolic adaptation that happens when you're in a cut. In other words... When you cut your calories, your metabolism starts to slow down to make up the difference. And in the studies that I've seen, when you interrupt that cut with days that are higher calorie, less of that happens. You tend to keep more muscle and you tend to burn more body fat as a, a result. Now, here's the no part, hmm. calling it a cheat day. Right, That's man. where I'm <clears throat> against because now what you're doing is you're emphasizing or strengthening this relationship where cutting is restricting and, you know, binging or cheat days is like, oh, this is great. And you do this on off type of deal where you're always either on point or you're totally off. I mean, in a perfect world. So like when I was competing, obviously, this is a lot of what I, I would be doing, right? Getting as I'm cutting for a show. Um, the refeed day is uh, all the meals ended up getting a half cup more of rice in them or a half cup rice. Plus I enjoyed an avocado in, you know, two or three of the meals. Yeah. Now a cheat day doesn't usually work that way. No. A cheat day is like, I eat whatever I what want. It, what crazy. it ends up doing. And, I, and, and I did go, I did mess around with it. So I'm not saying that I didn't play around with eating out, but what I found was when I did that, it was hard to stay away from that. Like once you introduce anybody who's ever gone on a strict diet, you notice after a couple of weeks of eating really clean whole foods, you start to lose those cravings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I no longer want the, those, the, the greasy burger, those things like that. I'm like, Oh man, I, my system feels so good. I'm actually craving a healthy. And like, right. that's a really good place to be. You know, a good way to fuck that up. Have a cheat day. Yeah. Yeah. Go go have a bunch of greasy fast food and then see if you're not craving it the next day or two. And then now all you're doing is thinking about my cheat day on Saturday. I can't wait to get to Saturday because I've all week I've been thinking like that is a you're you are you're setting yourself up for failure. You're promoting a, a bad relationship with food. The idea of you see a little more of what so you normally eat. That's right. This yeah. the, the science that we we know about the re, the refeed and the the higher calorie days. I I one hundred percent agree with, and I think that the 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 move is for you to just increase the meal sizes that you're having already would be a much smarter approach to getting the benefits scientifically of increasing calories for a day and then going back down, then allowing a day where you're going to let this food creep in. That's going to kick up all these cravings mm -hmm. that now I'm going to be thinking about it all week long. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. That's 100% how I, I used to advocate for it because first off, when you bump your calories, ghrelin tends to go up anyway, which makes your appetite go up. But when you introduce new and novel foods that also have effects on dopamine and serotonin and other reward systems of the brain, what you're what you're what you're going to do is make it exactly what Adam said. You're going to make it much harder to stick to later on. Plus, it it you know using the word cheat uh, makes it seem like the way you were eating before. You can't eat any other way anyway. And cheating is like you're breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. It's all part of your diet. Like it's all part of it. Whether you eat a burger or pizza. Uh, you know, I'm glad you said that too, Sal, because then there's these other things where it's like in a, in a, in a, in a nice setup, my refeed day, I would plan on like the night that I went out to dinner with Katrina on Friday night. Right. And then what I end up doing is I, I hit my macro targets and then I know 
that I'm dinner I'm gonna go over a little bit and I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy the the bread on the side or the mashed potatoes and gravy and stuff like that with my juicy steak and I'm not gonna freak out about exactly what it is because I don't know because I didn't weigh it and measure it myself and guess what today was the day I was supposed to have a little bit higher calorie day so to me like that is like the perfect way to try and and have a refeed day is to plan it around a a, a day or a night that's important. I'm going to the game. Yes. We're going to the Warriors game. And that's game. like, it's real life. Yeah. You know I, what it reminds me of? It's, it would be like this. It would be like, instead of having recovery days, so I'll work out and then I have days where I recover, we're going to call recovery days lazy days. Let's just do that. <laughs> so, hey, how many lazy days have you scheduled? Yeah. Like, think of the difference that uh, of, of a relationship that that would create right. with exercise. If you didn't have recovery days, you had lazy days. That's already a mindset going into it. 100%. So, a cheat day is like a lazy day. It's not a cheat day. It's just, I'm going to eat more today to fuel my body, to prevent metabolic adaptation, and it feels good. I'm going to have better workouts. And it's just different. Now, if you want to make it burgers and pizza on that day, that's fine, too. But how you label things, what you call things, how you consider things makes a big difference. Well, I know that because Adam already brought up the fact that like cheat days, a lot of times people will bring in all this like garbage and stuff. And then you bring the cravings, you ramp all that back up. It's already challenged enough to like increase your calories and then go right back to a deficit uh, to interrupt that. Because like a lot of people mentally, it's like if I'm going to try and stick with this, like I just want to hit a rhythm and I want to keep going yeah. with that same amount. And, and you know, to interrupt that, we've, we know that it's more beneficial. I know it's already more challenging for my clients to even just do that part. And now you're going to add in like foods that uh, will promote more cravings on top of that. So it's like, that's where I definitely caution. You, my traditional refeed day when I, when I was doing this what landed on Fridays and it almost always was sushi night dinner with Katrina. It was, and the way I looked at it was uh, I always scheduled my low calorie days during the week. So I'm, I'm, I'm dialed, I'm eating out of my Tupperware every single day. And then on Fridays, I would be due for the increase in calories. I'd still eat my Tupperware normal meals. But then Friday night, I go with my wife. We go have a yeah. nice sushi. It's about connecting with your wife. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not like overly counting or worrying. I know I'm probably going to eat in a you know surplus what? of, and I'm having, enjoying some rolls. Yeah, like, and you know what people end up doing with, with cheat, quote unquote cheat days uh, that I've noticed? This, this really, it's not a great behavior. It's they're eating alone. It's like today's my cheat day. Oh, I can't wait to go eat all this garbage. And they'll bring it home and they'll eat by themselves. Yeah. And and gorge. It's like porn. Yeah. 100%. Exactly. Or they'll find another person who's dieting and we're all going to go together yeah, and yeah. go and cheat together. Yeah. The mentality is totally wrong. But refeeds and and you know, I don't think it's 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 much more beneficial to not be on a consistent cut but rather interrupt it with days of higher calories. Next question is from Court Jim Fit. What are the best foods for bulking? What do you suggest for upping calories? All right. Well, that's the, funny. We just, we did, this kind of goes in line with what I was just saying with refeed days. Totally. So the best foods for bulking, the first criteria that I always consider is digestibility mm -hmm. because the biggest challenge with eating more food is things like bloat, indigestion, heartburn, constipation, like just digestive issues. And that'll prevent you from eating the calories. Do you know, that you you know how important what you're saying is mm -hmm. like, this is literally what, what, limited me from being able to build, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds of muscles through mus more muscle on my body over the course of my teenage and early 20 years. Same. Because Same. I thought, because I was eating McDonald's super size and extra, like, yep. oh man, I, I got to be so high in calorie. But what I, what I wasn't accounting for was after I ate that, I was so backed yeah. up for the next four or you five don't hours. You cram anything else in. Yeah, I didn't eat. I didn't eat anything. Not to mention the macro profile was way off. I had a little bit of protein, mostly carbs and saturated fat. Mm -hmm. So I got a bunch of calories, but then I didn't hit my protein intake. Then I wasn't hungry for four or five hours. Like understanding actually, when I made that switch to eating like like leaner, leaner, so lower in saturated fats, higher protein, good, good digestible carbs, like, uh, you know, potatoes, rice, sweet potato, yams. Yep. I was able to hit my macros and get my calories up, which is, was so weird for me as a young kid that was trying to build because I, I assumed because I could never, I, I had a hard time putting weight on that. I justified the behaviors around eating whatever food. And a lot of times there were food that was not ideal digestibility wise. Same from, thing. And it kept me from building. Yeah, build. It went from uh, any calories at all costs to calories that I can digest and that I'll be able to eat again later on way better. The first successful bulk I ever did where I really put on muscle. 
I want to say I was 16 or 17 years old. And that's when I pieced this together where instead of eating a bunch of bread and pasta, which I don't digest gluten super well, um, and a bunch of cereal and candy and sodas, I went rice, ground beef, and vegetables. I remember buying, this is the first time I went and bought some groceries myself. And I went and bought a bunch and my mom helped me cook it up because that's what Italian moms do. They cook your food for you. And I, and I ate ground beef and rice and vegetables and I gained over that summer, I think I gained like 10, 12 pounds of muscle, which was a lot, you know, mm -hmm. for a kid. And it was all because I could digest it. Like I'd eat this big meal two hours later, three hours later, I could eat again. Whereas before I eat this huge meal and I was just, oh, the next one was just a chore. And I couldn't eat those calories. I, so. I can't stress how important that is. And because I think when you're trying to gain and you you can't, you have a hard time putting weight on and building muscle, you, you easily justify the other foods and you don't realize what you're doing. And mm -hmm. so it, oatmeal became my staple with some, you know, whey protein in there. Then I would end up getting rice and chicken yep. thighs and vegetables were, you know, and then a juicy steak at the end of the night with more potatoes or rice, like all these foods that were very, because what I noticed was I'd be hungry. I could eat again in two or three 100%. hours where if I ate the Togo sandwich with chips and a soda, I didn't want to eat for four or five hours. Mm -hmm. If I had the McDonald's, I had the fast food that was high calorie. Totally. I wasn't getting enough high good quality protein and I wasn't and I wasn't hungry until four or, or five I, hours later. Yeah, what I would do like the terrible, like dirty bulk, uh, where I would like eat a meal and then I, I thought I had to have this like crazy ridiculous shake uh, in conjunction with that. So <laughs> yeah. it would be like this meal and then that on top of the meal yeah. and it was just like overwhelming to where I had like gastrointestinal problems I was fighting, you yeah. know, like all day long and then trying to eat on top of that's almost impossible. Bro, do you remember? I don't know if you guys, if you guys what, I mean, as a teenager, just before I figured this out, I would eat these ridiculous meals because I just like calories and then I'd sit in class and just my stomach brrr, yeah brrr. I'm like, oh, I don't feel yeah. good. Well, <laughs> this is what bulking is. Demons on. talking. Yeah, and then yeah. I justify. It's like, well, bulking, you know, it's only for hardcore people, so I'm just going to force myself yeah. to solve it. It's all about force. Like, keep forcing it in. Now, digestibility is real important. So best foods for most people, the, easily, the most easily digestible foods include uh, red meat, white meat, fish, um, and then vegetables. Well-cooked vegetables are easier to digest than raw vegetables. And then carbohydrates, white rice, buckwheat, Oatmeal uh, can be uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, potatoes, sweet potatoes. I I think sweet potatoes are even better than potatoes for digestion. I could eat way more sweet potatoes than, than regular. Potatoes. Yeah, I could I could do both pretty well. But I mean, that, I really that think right that's there. the key. One of my favorite dishes, and you said it already, was ground beef mixed with white rice. Man, I could eat like a. I make a, and you can make it in bulk. It's reasonably inexpensive if you buy it in bulk too. So if you buy the ground beef, cook in the bulk, rice and bone broth. You got yourself a high calorie you'd, and rice bowl. Tastes good. Goes down really easy. Yep. I can eat it again two hours later. Yep. Like that was such a that was a staple. That and chicken thighs and and and, the, and either the rice or sweet potatoes. Like those are like the staple meals for me. Which sounds funny because you're eating healthy and they clean. sound like yeah exactly. They sound like cutting foods. They do, yeah. and, and it and it is actually you just less of it, right? So that's really the the strategy is eating more of the healthier foods and. And I think the mistake that most people make that struggle with is putting weight on is their, their, their food choice. Next question is from usually Lauren for someone who can't digest whey protein powder. What's the best alternative protein powder? Okay. So good question because whey protein is the gold standard. It's got high branch chain amino acid and essential amino acid content, high leucine. So it's this really, mu it's really this kind of anabolic muscle building hormone. It's got health benefits. So whey protein is great. Unfortunately, it's dairy based, and a lot of people have issues with dairy. Even when they remove the lactose, uh, people have issues. Like, I'm one of those, right? So, I, it's not the lactose, it's just dairy proteins in general. So, I can't have whey. So, okay, what are the, what are the other solutions for protein powders? Okay, so you mm. could try egg protein powders. Uh, that's mm. very high quality. Now, here's the issue with egg protein powders. They also tend to cause yeah. digestive issues in people. <laughs> There's some fumes uh, involved. With yes, egg it's, protein. Yeah, so that can be issues. So you could go, when you're looking at the plant-based one, pea protein seems to have the best amino acid profile. But when you're going with plant proteins, you tend to want to have a blend. You want a blend of different types of uh, vegan sources because you'll get a better amino acid profile. And then you want digestive enzymes in that protein powder. Um, but pea protein is one of the better ones. Collagen protein or bone broth protein yeah. considered a lower quality protein because it's low in essential amino acids. However, it's one of the easiest digesting proteins you'll find anywhere. In fact, it's the it's one of the only protein powders that would be recommended to people with uh, gut issues. In fact, mm. when you have gut issues, one of the things they do is they tell you have more bone broth or have collagen protein because it helps 
repair the gut. Well, you might be asking, well, it's not as good of a protein as whey. Well, here's how you make up the difference. You have more of it. Yeah. So I could have a ton of collagen protein, um, and that makes up for the fact that it's not as high in essential amino acids as How do as you whey. feel about beef isolate? Be Some people are great with beef isolate. Yeah. Some I've heard it's great. I just yeah, haven't tried it. Some people are really, really good with beef isolate. Um, and if you find some, here's a problem that I found with beef isolate proteins is that read the label. It'll say like beef protein, read the label. They'll often add dairy to the beef isolate mm. protein. Oh, really? Yes. And so Sneaky. like, yeah, I've, seen, if I've found like three where I look and I'm like, oh, this looks good. And then I'll try it and be like, why is this messing me up? Then I'll read the label like an idiot after I took it. And I'll be like, oh, that's nice. They added dairy to this why the uh, hell did i buy well this i see everybody's place? posting your your paleo valley bone broth now so mm -hmm. after you talked about it everybody's has been sharing it and i do see everybody saying how amazing it is. well tastes. you know we, bone broth and collagen are interesting it's yes it's true it's not an, as anabolic as whey but again it's so easy to digest you could just have it like i could have a hundred gram and i do this all the time i'll have a hundred grams of bone broth protein in, in a shake and feel fine. I can't do that with any other protein powder. That'll that'll totally mess me up. So 100 grams of bone broth protein is that going to be as is as effective as let's say 40 grams away? Yeah, it's 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 way more protein. So it makes up. Well, well we know like, this was studies. It's studies like going back to the conversation we just have about the fast food. Yeah. I mean, when you when you're trying to build you, calories is part of the game, right? Like you got to get more calories. So you think that having this 1500 calorie or 1700 calorie meal would be, be ideal, but not if it fucks up, you know, you yeah. can't digest it, right? So if you can't digest it and you and you don't want to eat for four or five hours later yeah. again, well, then it kind of defeats the purpose. The same thing goes with the whey protein. It could be the best protein in the world, but if it upsets your stomach, well, then you're better off getting something that's even a little bit lower quality, but you can do more of. Now, now the other thing about collagen protein, it actually uh, suppresses your appetite for long. Whey, whey is... Uh, a really good bulking protein because it tends to have a very negative, it, it doesn't have a huge effect on appetite. So if you're trying to pound calories and you can tolerate whey, it's great. Collagen is great for dieting because it actually suppresses appetite more than almost any other protein that they've studied. So, and mm. I think it's because of the way that it, it sits in the stomach or the, in the system. Um, but you'll take it and you'll feel full longer. So if you're trying to cut, that's another option. But you know, again, vegan sources, pea is the best, blends are even better. Egg protein, phenomenal, but digestive issues a lot of times with that. Beef protein isolates good, and then uh, collagen or bone broth. That's that's where I tend to go. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that are free that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. Again, they cost nothing. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another yeah. thing you'll see less injury as well.